All right, we seem to be leveling off there. Um, so thank you again, everyone, for joining us on our latest media briefing on important health topics and healthcare issues in the news. As we all know by now, I'm Dr. Samantha Hill. I'm the current president of the Ontario Medical Association. We represent more than 43,000 doctors and medical students across the province. It's been 14 months since the World Health Organization declared a pandemic. 14 very long months for everyone. And now people all over the globe are asking themselves, how will it end? Because we know that pandemics always end. In the past, the viruses that caused pandemics didn't go away exactly, but they became less deadly. A descendant of the Spanish flu virus is the modern H1N1, and it still circulates to this day. The human body is amazing and our immune systems adapt, learn different ways to fend off the deadliest versions of infection. And instead of causing widespread death, over time, the viruses cause small surges of illnesses, illnesses that are much, much milder. The pandemic flu of yore essentially morphed into seasonal flu that we see yearly. But do all packs end in the same way? And what will the end of COVID-19 pandemic look like? Can we even say for certain? What will be the signs that the pandemic is ending or is finally over? Will there be a day that we wake up and we can say today is the day the pandemic ends? What will new normal really look like when we finally settle into it? Will we go back to living our lives the way we did before? Or will some of our behaviors have changed forever? And will everyone respond the same way? Or will that post-pandemic experience be different for different people? Some big questions and more, I know. And they're on the forefront of all of our minds as pandemic fatigue hits all new highs and peaks but we do see that light at the end of the tunnel. So to walk us through what to expect, we have with us today an epidemiologist, a virologist, and a psychiatrist. Dr. Zane Chagla, an associate professor at McMaster University, co-medical director of infection control at St. Joseph's Healthcare Hamilton, and a consultant in infection control at Woodstock General Hospital. During the COVID-19 crisis, he has contributed to policy planning and to clinical trials on COVID-19 therapies. Dr. Allison McGeer, a professor in laboratory medicine and pathobiology at the Della Lena School of Public Health, the University of Toronto, an infectious disease specialist at the Sinai Health System in Toronto. Since February 2020, she has been working on research related to the prevention and management of COVID-19. Last but not least, Dr. Thomas Unger, psychiatrist in chief at St. Michael's Hospital in Toronto and an associate professor of psychiatry at the University of Toronto. I'm going to start today's session by turning it over to Dr. Chagla. Dr. Chagla, can you start by outlining for us all how the pandemic will end? How will we measure our success in Canada? And will the end be the same for everyone across the globe? So thanks for that. And uh, I think I got the hardest question of the day, which is fantastic. Um, so, you know, I, I think many of us have this vision in our heads of the pandemic ending with a light switch that, uh, you know, cases essentially come down to zero and, and, you know, life goes back to normal. I think people have to be comfortable with the fact that COVID-19 is going to be around for the foreseeable future and probably into the long-term future. This is a disease where, um, you know, there's a significant pre-symptomatic phase where testing isn't efficient enough to pick out everyone, where vaccines work really well, but aren't enough to eliminate every case. Uh, and there is people that sneak through without necessarily being tested. And we're still learning about animal reservoirs as it is. And, and so really has fundamental characteristics of a disease that isn't uh, uh, able to be eliminated. And so I think, you know, the pandemic ends in Canada uh, with 
really our healthcare utilization from COVID-19, those significant and serious complications of COVID-19 being put uh, aside and people now turning this into an outpatient disease as compared to an inpatient disease. You know, you reflect back to March of 2020 and those images of what was happening in New York, what was happening in Wuhan, what was happening in Bergamo. And it was fundamentally what we did was there to protect the healthcare system such that, you know, the disease was only going to hit a small number of people slowly such that we could provide care for people who needed care uh, rather than those, those scenes we were seeing uh, across the world. You know, you fast forward now, a, month, a year and two months later, we have vaccines, which have essentially turned this disease into something that can be managed much more as an outpatient, where a fully vaccinated individual faces a much lower risk of significant complications of COVID-19, uh, has a lower risk of transmitting COVID-19 or being infectious for COVID-19. Uh, and, you know, uh, uh, we're seeing real life examples in the United States, the United Kingdom and Israel of the power of these vaccines in terms of improving healthcare demands and healthcare utilization. However, I do want to say, you know, the end of the pandemic in Canada or whatever this state is going to be where healthcare utilization is going to come down isn't necessarily the end of this pandemic. And, you know, I think as part of our, our messaging and our thinking around when is this gonna be over, is gonna be when is this gonna be over for the world? We're seeing the devastation in South Asia now with the COVID pandemic and, and subsequent consequences uh, of healthcare utilization and demand being scaled to the point where, where things are falling apart. There are many other vulnerable settings across the world in South America and Sub-Saharan Africa, in South Asia, where uh, the development and spread, particularly of more infectious variants, means a significant number of people that could get infected and die, where non-pharmaceutical interventions like lockdowns have significant and serious effects for people in terms of malnutrition and other public health complications. And so, you know, as, as we think about our exit plan, we need to think about the global exit plan as part of this, um, recognizing that, uh, you know, this isn't end until everyone has equitable access to vaccines. The World Health Organization has been very vocal about this over the last few weeks, recognizing that this is now a vaccine preventable disease. Uh, and you know the equity of vaccines around the world means that more people don't die of a pathogen that could be treated two weeks before with an injection in the arm. Uh, and, uh, and realistically, even from a selfish point of view as a Canadian context, the development of variants of concern are going to be directly linked into that epidemic outbreak spread in areas with incredible vulnerability based on their population we as Canadians could lose progress in terms of what we've achieved in this last six months uh, if you know, a variant of concern emerges in a vulnerable area that then you know, causes people to become ill, that breaks through vaccines, that changes the game altogether. Finally, you know, to the end of this, and a more positive note is you know, how we measure how it's over. And I think that's the fundamental question that's coming to the table. We're seeing things change as COVID-19 changes. I think we're seeing testing, for example, change significantly where you know, we, we are seeing percent positivity being high with cases coming down, really suggesting not only some of the testing we were doing offline for things like you know, surgery in schools where there were a lot of negative tests um, you know, have come off, but behaviors change as part of testing. And our ability to you know, test everyone in the community is probably not gonna be something going forward uh, as um, you know, more people are fully vaccinated and feel like they're not being put at risk and, and don't have the incentive to go out and get tested or isolate or quarantine. And so our metrics for success are not necessarily gonna be related to case counts. They're likely gonna be related to our healthcare utilization because again, this is a fundamental piece of why we are where we are today with lockdowns and, and other public health measures. Uh, and similarly, our ICU capacities in dealing with this. 
does this mean that the winter when cases will rise um, and influenza is probably going to be a part of our future uh, um, means that we have to um, feel like things are getting out of control? No, but I think we need to set reasonable benchmarks in terms of how much healthcare we can dedicate to COVID-19 in the long-term future, recognizing that vaccines will significantly alter that as time goes on. Um, but also, I think we also, as part of what we talk about as the pandemic being over, is putting on the table what we think are long-term measures of success, including hospitalizations and ICUs, and where we're going to do surveillance for when things are changing, recognizing that community testing is likely not going to be an intervention that's sustainable in the short, in the long-term future uh, as people's risk profile changes from COVID-19. So, you know, bottom line, it's a it's a very vague answer. You know, I think we are seeing inklings of healthcare utilization, particularly in, in other places of the world where, you know, that is really the, the end of, of what the pandemic has done for, for healthcare systems. Um, but, you know, I, I think again, you know, it's gonna be over when we, we deal with our, our liabilities in the rest of the world and protect many other vulnerable populations outside of our own. Thank you so much, Dr. Chagla. For our next question, I'm going to turn to Dr. McGeer. Dr. McGeer, as an infectious disease specialist, what can you tell us about what we can expect from this virus? Will it be eradicated completely as people get vaccinated and adapt, or will it evolve into something else? And will we continue to need to protect ourselves? You're doing well with impossible questions today, Dr. Hill. Um, so, you know, from a viral point of view, <clears throat> there's still a substantial number of uncertainties. Uh, the good end of the spectrum would be if the evolution we've seen in the last year is just this new virus adapting to humans. So, you know, it first infected a human 15 months ago. It, it's going to learn to live with us. Um, and the process will learn to live with us. It's you know, evolved into something that is more transmissible uh, and in some cases causes more severe disease. This might be the end of the story. And in favor of that is the fact that what we're seeing in this virus at the moment is substantially convergent evolution. So it's the same mutations appearing in different variants that obviously give it advantages. So maybe it's gonna stop. And if it stops, and if the vaccines are work for a long time, um, and if there's not enough infection of other mammals, and that's another question we don't know. We do know that other mammals, deer mice, dogs, you know, a variety of other mammalian species can be infected with this virus. It might or might not be sustainable outside humans. So not sustainable outside humans, vaccine works for a long time, uh, doesn't evolve, we might eradicate. But as Dr. Chag has already pointed out, probably not, okay? We have eradicated smallpox, we're close to polio, but eradicating any disease, even with really good vaccines, is very difficult and very expensive. And the odds are good that it's not gonna be worthwhile. That once enough people have immunity, that this will be a mild enough disease, that it won't be worth the, the cost and effort to eradicate. So that's, that's the good end. And on the good end, I think next winter, particularly for people in healthcare and infection control and public health. It's gonna be a hard winter. Next winter, we still won't have much of the world vaccinated. There are gonna be issues with travel, long list of things, but if we can get through, next winter will still be better than last winter. Um, and, and if we can get through, then, you know, the, the virus will get to the whimpering stage next summer. You know, this is not with a bang, but with a whimper. It's just a question of when the whimper is coming. The more difficult scenario would be if this virus is deciding to continue to evolve. Okay, so then it's gonna turn into something like influenza that can change over time and escape from immunity. Uh, and on that side, you can argue that some of the new variants are variants that are um, escaping from current vaccines. Doesn't appear to be intentional at the moment, but it could be. Um, and if that happens, then we may end up with a situation that's like influenza is now which is, it's no longer nearly as serious a disease, but it's not a trivial disease and we're gonna need ongoing vaccination programs to protect substantial numbers of people around the world. It'll probably get milder and milder to some point, but it's a little bit hard to know where that ends. So I'm, I'm hoping for the first, okay? This is 
the end. We just got to get through next winter. Um, but I think most epidemiologists and virologists are expecting the second, which is this is a virus that we're going to have to live with and with vaccines for in the long term. Thank you, Dr. McGear. I have to admit, I was hoping you would say it would end with like a splash of rainbows and sparkles and unicorns across the sky, but I guess that wasn't reasonable. Dr. Unger, nice. Dr. Unger, we're going to turn to you next. How will people respond as we start to reopen the workplaces and society? Will we circulate freely and return to life as we knew it? Or do you think some things are going to change permanently? Yeah, thank you. Great. Great question. Um, I think what we're going to see, I mean, it's been absolutely normal and expected that people are worried, anxious, depressed, concerned. This is a real existential threat to health, to our society. So we're hearing the terms, all the people that are anxious and depressed. Well, that's somewhat normal. Differentiating the emotional distress from actual illness is where the difference that we come in at and we have to sort out. So what we're going to see, in my opinion, leave the exact date, the, the epidemiologic date to the to the infectious disease and epidemiologists to determine when they declare it over. But I think we'll see what's in keeping with most normal people's tolerance for risk and, and personality styles. We'll probably see a small portion, 10, maybe up to a third of the public. The minute that date is there, they're just gonna go wild. They're just gonna be out there partying like nothing happened and over the top, uh, ignoring any continued risks or, or cautions from us. We might already be seeing some of that among some of the population. Uh, and th there'll be those total risk takers who just want to ignore everything and really have a good time immediately. I, I wish I was like, I'm not going to quite be there. Uh, not advisable, but we'll see that. We'll probably see the big bulk of the middle of uh, society, at least a third to a half, gradually, cautiously dipping their toe in the shallow end, starting to creep into the shallow end, in and out. If they're comfortable, it goes well. One time they try again, they try again. That gradual exposure with comfort, they'll watch people around them doing that. And over time, gradually slide back into most of our normal life routines, but with some possible changes, maybe taking public transit, starting to return to workplaces. Most people will adapt gradually over time. It won't be a sudden thing. And then we will see a small segment, I think 10, 20% up to a third who will have some difficulty getting back to that, remain overly fearful and avoidant, not understand the numbers and just be so scared of having isolated uh, that they might need a little bit of support and encouragement, but most of them will come around. Um, there may be a very tiny percent who have pre-existing uh, mental health, the psychiatric conditions, anxiety disorders, clinical depressions, or, or others who had those precipitated or really brought out during this pandemic who may need some extra support, actual treatment. But for the most part, people are more resilient than we often give them credit for. People use their own uh, natural support systems and mechanisms of family coping strategies, and they do come around. Most do not need treatment. There may be a very small subset though who might actually be significantly effective, uh, uh, a post-traumatic stress disorder type of condition, perhaps healthcare providers or frontline workers who've witnessed things that out of keeping with normal experience, as well as some people who've had family events that have happened uh, where they may have a type of moral distress or moral injury, unable to attend funerals of their loved ones, uh, having to witness the pandemic in other parts of the world where they're not allowed to help or where we are somewhat helpless or have to delay and wait. So there will be a small group of those people, but I do think it'll be a gradual shift with different people over a different period of time. So I think it'll be a slow and steady and hopeful transition, gaining comfort with gradual exposure. Um, and you know, we've been through many significant effects, events in, in history, the, from the Great Depression to the Second World War, which affected my family. Uh, but we've been fairly blessed without this huge significant societal thing for a while. Um, but those do change people. So some things will remain. I know since the 2003 SARS outbreak, I worked at one of the epicenter hospitals at that time at Northbrook General. Ever since then, my infection control practices, my pushing the elevator button with a pen rather than my finger, uh, my uh, adherence to people with a cold wearing a mask in my office changed. So we will keep some practices. So some things will change, but that's not an illness. That's just the way humans adapt. And I think we will all uh, be affected by that, but that's the nature of our normal human experience. 
Thank you so much for that, Dr. Unger. Thank you all, Drs. Unger, McGeer, and Chagla for those moments of insight. We are now going to open up our Q&A session. I would ask all of the attendees to put your questions into the Q&A chat. As always, if we don't get to your questions in time, the media team will follow up with you. You can also email media at oma.org with additional requests for interviews. Finally, we will have a recording of this session available later this afternoon. With that, I'll turn it over to Ryan, with whom we are in exceptionally good hands to walk us through the Q&A. Thank you, Dr. Hill. First question is from Mike Pearson at uh, Hamilton Community News. What is the likelihood that we will need an annual or somewhat reoccurring vaccine program, similar to the seasonal flu shot program with reformulated vaccines to provide protection against new variants of concern in the months and years to come? Dr. McGeer, do you wanna weigh in on that one? Uh, somewhere between two and 98%. Uh, I, I think impossible to predict at the moment, um, but I, I, honestly, I think probably north of 50%. Um, the good news about it is that the phase one trials of combined influenza and and SARS-CoV-2 vaccines are already running, okay? So the vaccine manufacturers know this is coming. They understand that we may well need them. And so people are working really hard to uh, try to make sure that if we do need them, we have the right setup um, and, and we'll get them uh, in time. But it's, we're not gonna know um, for another nine months at least, probably a couple of years. Thank you, Dr. McGear. The next question is from Joanna Frikidich at um, the Hamilton Spectator. As more things reopen in Ontario, what is the best way for people to weigh the risks? Just because something is open, does that mean you should do it? There's a lot of confusion around whether it's good for, actually, let's stop there and answer that question first. Dr. Shegla, do you wanna weigh in on that one? Yeah, I mean, it, it is a good question, right? And I think uh, Dr. Ungar really talked about kind of the approaches people have in terms of everything, in, in terms of their personal risk profile, in terms of how they've been impacted in the year um, and how they approach these things. I think what we're seeing in some of the reopenings is, is there certainly is a very enthusiastic component that will go about doing what is acceptable to them. We're seeing in the United States, we're seeing in the UK right now. Um, and, and so, you know, I think people make their own judgment based on their own personal risk. Adding to that now with the full vaccine series, which many will have as things open up, you know, their own personal risk profile changes significantly. And so, you know, I, I think, um, we have to make responsible decisions in the months ahead in terms of what opens in that context, um, as we can expect that every person is going to engage with what opens. There may be some that won't, but um, you know, I, I think saying that you know, yes, we can open up some high risk establishment uh, and expect people will not go um, is probably you know a bit of a fallacy now, and we're seeing that play out in other places in the world. Thank you, Dr. Chegla. Looks like Dr. Hill wants to weigh in. I would, thanks, Ryan. So uh, taking just a diff, bit of a different angle at this, I would just like to remind all of the patients out there who are trying to figure out how to navigate the next steps that their doctors are here to help them and are here to advise them. We know that the last year has brought about an immense amount of information that quite frankly, very few people apart from maybe Dr. Chagla and Dr. McGee are prepared to wade through in full detail. And so we don't expect the average person to be an expert in epidemiology, virology, or COVID-19. What we do expect them is to be an expert in themselves, to know themselves, what their risk tolerances are, what they're worried about, and to reach out to their doctors to help them navigate those next steps. And so just to remind everyone that your family doctor is there, that there are public health offices that are available, and that you aren't facing these questions alone. Thank you, Dr. Hill. Uh, Follow-up question from Joanna Frikidich at the Hamilton Spectator. There's a lot of confusion around whether it's good for Ontarians to get their second AstraZeneca dose at 10 weeks instead of 12 weeks, with the province saying it's okay, but some doctor's office, offices refusing to provide it before 12 weeks. What is your recommendation around this? Also, how safe is it to get AstraZeneca as your second dose after Ontario had its first death from BIT? Um, 
Dr. McGeer, would you like to weigh in on that one? Sure. I think, you know, the both of those questions are, are questions about some of the uncertainties we have because this is a pandemic and we don't have all the data. At a, we, we don't have, we have data for four weeks and 12 weeks for second dose of AstraZeneca vaccine. So I can tell you that 12 weeks is better than four weeks. What I can't tell you is whether 10 weeks is better than eight weeks or 12 weeks is better than 10 weeks. Personally, from my experience with vaccines, I'm with the province on this one. I do not think that your response is gonna be different at 10 weeks than it is at 12 weeks, just from everything we know about response to other vaccines. Um, but, but part of the reason there are discrepancies here um, is because there are unknowns and you will sometimes get different opinions. Uh, the decision about second dose AstraZeneca, again, is, is one of those things that's an individual decision about what people's risks perceptions are and, and what they choose to do. Um, there is no question that the viral vector vaccines, including AstraZeneca, are associated with a risk of this vaccine-induced thrombotic thrombocytopenia. It's, a, it's rare. Um, we don't have an exact estimate for it, um, uh, particularly for the second dose, still a lot of argument about what that number is gonna be. Um, and now you're balancing the ability to get a second dose of vaccine earlier versus waiting for your second dose of an mRNA vaccine. Um, and that waiting period, of course, puts you at some risk of COVID, which is also bad for you. So this is another discussion with your doctor thing to do. Think about what your, at, at an individual level, what your risks are, what your risk tolerance is, um, <clears throat> which one of those things is the right thing for you to do. Thank you, Dr. McGear. Next question I'll ask Dr. Shagla to answer. You said it when Canada makes its pandemic exit plan, we need to think about how the rest of the world is going to exit as well. Can you elaborate on what you think Canada needs to do to help other countries? Yeah, I mean, there's been a lot of work done in the background uh, between the World Trade Organization, and the G7 in terms of releasing patents off vaccines and allowing for local production. You know, that's a good long term plan and, and certainly will help with capacity, but these are complex vaccines. These aren't the same as the vaccines we've made over the last 15 years. They're, there's a lot of nanotechnology, microfluidics, uh, you know, to the point where this isn't something that can be scaled up in a month. It's probably going to be months to years before you can get significant production capacity for some of these vaccines uh, that are really potent, like the mRNA vaccines. That then comes back to what can we do in the short term? Well, we know as Canadians and, and the, the unfortunate reality is the fact that we don't make many, many vaccines on site. That every single vaccine we use in Canada is a vaccine that's made somewhere else in the world that's imported into Canada for use in its citizens. And I think until the gap between vaccine production and vaccine acquisition, by particular nations is, uh, is really you know, shrunken down, it is a zero sum game. The vaccines we use in Canada are not gonna be able to be deployed elsewhere. And so you know, does that mean we don't vaccinate our population? No, I mean, I think we have to obviously get out of this and restart society and be able to work and interact as normal, but we do have to make difficult decisions about what the next three months of our vaccine plan looks like. You know, as we're talking about getting people second doses of AstraZeneca, where do we set the cutoff to say, okay, we're not going to accept any more AstraZeneca into Canada? Um, as uh, we talk about again, the AstraZeneca plan, you know, where, where's our cutoff for Johnson and Johnson and the Janssen vaccine? And do we need this as part of our vaccine strategy? Can we give that one back to the world? And I think with more emerging data, you know, Pfizer's big issue around the um, the cold chain requirement in the ultramarine fridges is now really, you know, even Health Canada is now approved for the Pfizer vaccine to be in a typical refrigerator for up to 30 days. There's even more attractiveness to the mRNA vaccines as part of the global uh, vaccine approach. And so, you know, I think again, there probably does need to be a solid plan for how much vaccine Canada needs to be safe uh, and to finish its vaccine plan and an equal and aggressive effort right now to redirect much of our current vaccine supply into the COVAX system. And the other part is I think our, our role as Canadians and as a G7 country supporting this 
will hopefully ripple down to the rest of the world into you know their obligations into the rest of the world outside of that. We've seen the United States and President Biden putting out 80 million doses of vaccine into into um, outside of the United States. Um, and so again, you know, many other nations are, are at a place where they can certainly donate into a global vaccine supply and the World Health Organization is calling for it. So we really do need to think about where we're going to draw the line in terms of what we're going to import into Canada and what we want to, again, put back to the world, not doing that at the end of the vaccine strategy in September, October, November, doing it now so that we don't have um, deaths that occur in uh, August, September, November, uh, and October um, from a lack of vaccination. Thank you very much, Dr. Chegla. Next question for Dr. Unger. History tells us we will see a lot of PTSD and depression after the pandemic. What should we be watching for in ourselves and our loved ones? Yeah, great question. So they have been predicting yet a, the number keeps changing, fourth wave, fifth wave, I'm not sure which wave of the, the mental health wave in terms of people coming, requiring assistance, uh, coming for help and whether we have the resources. We're starting to see that in our emergency rooms and in the acute care sector. We didn't see it the first wave, but uh, since September of 2020, things picked up significantly. Um, let's not confuse normal distress and just human experience that we need time to adapt to and get over, which most will, with actual illness and requiring treatment. Illness and treatment is where your physician or other you know, credible online resources can assist you to determine. Usually we look for a depressed or irritable mood, disturbances in sleep, interest, energy, concentration, feelings of guilt and worthlessness, uh, physical symptoms, and maybe even thoughts of life not being worth living or suicidal thoughts. Marked anxiety is things where you can't function because you're paralyzed with the fear. You're having these panic attacks, which are adrenaline rushes that make you think you're having a heart attack or shortness of breath. Those are times one needs help if that persists and you can't function and reach out to your health provider, your physician, family physician are, are really, and the emergency rooms are open when it's that acute. Um, PTSD is a slightly different animal. Again, remembering this, having thoughts about it, adapting your life to it is not PTSD. PTSD is when you are numb, can't experience any pleasure or joy, are re-experiencing a trauma in nightmares or daily flashbacks, um, and that type of stuff. And that's a very different animal. So really to, to diagnose that, you should see a health provider because that will require treatment. And, and our concern is with an already you know, stressed health system, often operating at around 100% most of the time anyway, where is the flex capacity to absorb that increase requirement for care? I'll speak to my, my area of mental health and substance use disorders. Um, that has been uh, structurally or systemically under resourced and funded. I work with the Mental Health Commission of Canada's structural stigma research team. So that's well recognized and it's been being addressed, thank goodness, but will it be addressed in, in time for it to catch up to the coming mental health wave, not only for the individual person's experiences of sad, not just regular sadness, but clinical depression, anxiety, both for existing, but when the economic impacts hit some, those who couldn't work through the pandemic and that compounds and precipitates the unemployment or, or the misery on the small group of society who, who didn't do as well as some of us were able to write it out. That's what we're really worried about. When all the, the financial supports and assistances stop uh, and things get, get real and it's hard to get back, uh, that will also cause a bit of a, a wave which is already occurring. That's what we're very much concerned about because there already was a wave. There has been an opioid death epidemic crisis anyhow. So we really think attention to that and we're, we're ready to do that. We have the know-how not only science, techno-scientifically with epidemiology, but human nature, because uh, people's tolerance for risk, whether they seek care, don't seek care, that's also the very, the very irrational human emotional brain kicking in. You know, how we, we, we see risk, but at a certain point, our brains just go danger, and it's not rational, and, you, and people freak out. So really bringing that into our planning, uh, and I just hope people do seek out for care, and I hope that uh, we are able to provide that care. We do our best to, but we need support in that. It's a whole system of care around it uh, that we're here to provide as physicians, but the whole health system needs to support that with all the enablers to support us in providing that care. Thank you, Dr. Ungar. 
Next question from Ray Chan. Um, I'll ask Dr. Chegla if you would like to answer it. Uh, in the near future, how's the idea of a vaccine passport or QR code to enter concerts or sports games? Yeah, it's a, a really uh, a topical issue. Uh, and, you know, certainly there was, there was, there was a history of vaccine passports uh, with passports. Uh, so, you know, in, in terms of travel to particular nations at particular times of year, um, you know, yellow fever, meningococcal vaccine have been tied to your ability to enter a particular place or, you know, or a need to get vaccinated right at the point of entry. Um, you know, the, the United States is using vaccinations as part of a more voluntary effort in the sense that uh, you know, people are fully vaccinated, they take off their masks, they may get preferential places in sports events. Um, uh, you know, small private events may require people to be vaccinated, but there are a litany of ethical and, and legal and privacy issues that go along with uh, the need for a vaccine passport. Um, and uh, again, you know, how do you um, how do you enforce uh, what types of exclusions are you allowed and, and human rights issues in terms of people that decide to exclude themselves from a vaccine in that sense. So, you know, do I think we are probably going to tie vaccines to things like travel? Absolutely. And a country can do exactly what they want to do in terms of what who they want to bring in outside of their own citizens. Do I see it being tied to a place like, you know, going to a concert or going to a movie? Well, then you, you create a litany of other issues that are really difficult to wrangle with in that context. And so rather than necessarily, you know, um, having negative side effects from not vaccinating, it may be more in the context to voluntarily push people to get vaccinated, even at those engagements, rather than, um, you know, requiring it as a, as a proof of entry in that sense. Thank you, Dr. Chegla. Dr. McGear, you mentioned this virus can mutate into, um, sorry, to infect other mammals. What would this look like? Could it affect our food sources? How about our pets? So I, I don't think this virus is likely to mutate enough to become uh, really successful in other species. Most viruses are species specific. So, you know, human coronaviruses and human influenza viruses infect humans and there's whale influenza viruses and musk oxen have their own influenza viruses. So there's, there's not much cross species. Coronaviruses are, however, a little different on two fronts. The first is there's probably more spillover. So most of what we've seen with SARS-CoV-2 so far has been just individual animals that have been exposed as part of households, you know, household pets, mink farms. So congregate living for minks, okay? You can have outbreaks of, of SARS-CoV-2, but it's not, it, it's probably not enough. It, it's not a change from the human virus and it's not enough to sustain it, and it doesn't look like it's gonna move into another mammalian species and wreak havoc in that species the way it has in humans. Um, that's not a guarantee, however, that it can't live in those species for long enough to keep reinfecting humans at periodic intervals, right? So if it establishes itself in wild mink, you're not frequently going to get human infections, but you'll be able to get human infections. If it infects raccoons, you know, then we're in more trouble because there's much more human raccoon interaction. And it might do that because coronaviruses are just a little more flexible than other viruses in terms of what they can do and, and how widespread they can be. So it's a it, it's, it shouldn't be on the top of anybody's lists of concerns. I think the only time it would come up would be if we were seriously talking about wanting to eradicate this virus, then we would have to know before we tried how successful it could be at infecting other mammals. Thank you, Dr. McGear. Dr. Chegla, history has shown us that pandemics become endemics. Are there any signs yet of this happening or starting to happen with COVID anywhere in the world? Um, it, it, so nothing that has been successful, I would say, um, you know, there, there are the cases of, you know, Manaus in, in Brazil, which had a, a large number of people infected with COVID-19, uh, and, and a lot of the, um, the seroprevalence data that was done in rural settings suggesting 50, 70% of people had had COVID-19, um, 
but they still saw a fairly devastating second wave, uh, you know, the emergence of a novel variant that likely could uh, reinfect individuals. And so, you know, again, you know, being completely endemic is, is, uh, is kind of off the table there as they still saw, you know, again, a surge of it. Um, uh, I think, you know, another example is India right now where, where they had, you know, thought many people were talking in January about why India had come under control as a place with incredible vulnerability where in the slums we saw significant again positivity in serum prevalence studies um, but again all it took was you know a variant that was more transmissible to find its way through people that didn't weren't prior infected and even break through some of those old uh, infected individuals. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, I, I don't think anyone's been able to prove it with a vast strategy of, of simple herd immunity through natural infection. Um, uh, right now, I think Israel is probably the closest example of what endemic uh, COVID-19 looks like with vaccination, where uh, the reproductive rates continue to go down, cases end up being, you know, the handfuls a day and uh, and the health system is completely spared although there are some people still within their healthcare system with COVID-19 so um yeah that's probably the closest example now in, in reality and, and we're looking at places like the United States and the UK in terms of how their responses mimic what happened in Israel. Thank you Dr. Tegla. Next question from Melissa Kudo-Zuber at Canadian Press. Uh, directed toward Dr. McGear. Dr. McGear, you touched on this with AstraZeneca already, but do we know what the ideal dosing is, interval is yet for all of the available vaccines? If supply, expiration dates, et cetera, weren't an issue, is it still advisable from a purely effectiveness point of view for us to wait 12 weeks longer or between doses? So, you know, what I'm really hoping is that we'll get the whole world vaccinated before we get the answer to that question, okay? Um, because, because once you've got two doses into people, it no longer matters what the answer to that question is, okay? Because we're only talking about booster doses after this. Um, truth is that all of our vaccine schedules are somewhat arbitrary. We know that it's usually best to wait at least eight weeks between doses of, well, at, yeah, some number between four and eight weeks, but usually eight weeks is better than four if you can between vaccines. Um, and sometime be going out from there to six months doesn't usually doesn't make very much difference. Um, but but all of our vaccine schedules are invented fundamentally. We we decide what we think will work, and then we try it out. And if it works, we say great, and we move on. And we don't spend a lot of time saying, well, if we vaccinate you at ten weeks or twelve weeks or fourteen weeks or six weeks, is that a little bit better? So I think the fundamental answer is past eight weeks, it, it's maybe a good idea to wait to eight weeks. Beyond eight weeks, it probably doesn't matter whether it's eight, 12, 16, there might be some small differences, but they're probably not gonna translate to differences in the effectiveness uh, of vaccines. But really we just need to get two doses into people around the world. Thank you, Dr. McGear. Next question for Dr. Ungar. What should we be doing now to address the mental health challenges you've raised? And are there areas of mental health that should be treated as priorities? For example, addictions first or anxiety disorders or psychotic disorders. So I, I wouldn't rank them by the disease state. That's not how we do it. We do it by acuity and severity and, and risk to your life. Um, uh, there is an opioid epidemic for a number of reasons and high death rates. Uh, persons with severe mental illness have long been ignored. Uh, in my opinion, my opinion, much of our marginalized homeless population are suffering from severe mental illnesses that are just unrecognized, unaddressed, because they're not categorized the same way. Perhaps so your lovely grandparent with dementia who goes wandering uh, would not be allowed to do that, but severe mental illnesses our society categorizes differently. So I would continue to have the same categories for acuteness of care uh, going forward. Um, I'm sorry, the first part of the question was, what should we be doing to address mental health challenges yeah. you've raised? And I think really, I mean, checking in with each other is a good thing. Reaching out, connecting, asking people how they're doing, encouraging them if they're not doing well to either self-educate if we have any good public information to see if this is regular concern and sadness, which we all have at the strange time, or if it's more than that. Uh, and if it's more than that, 
encouraging them to seek out help. Reach out to your healthcare provider, your family physician, any other source of uh, telephone line, crisis line, uh, because help's available and it can be addressed. And people often self-stigmatize or, or undervalue emotional distress as being legit. They don't think it's the same. Uh, of course, when my hockey team loses, I have emotional distress, but ongoing sadness and impairing my functioning, I should reach out if that goes on for weeks and weeks, uh, but I might not want to because I was not raised that way. So people don't do that. So really encouraging them to, to reach out for help, get assessed, let a professional help educate you. And if needed, uh, encourage you to get care and treatment, whatever is evidence-based and relevant. Uh, my concern is, do we have access to all those treatments? Do we have the capacity for all that? Because uh, the medical community is covered and supported in our public health system. Some of the other enablers we have may not be. So encourage them to get checked out. If it doesn't seem right, tell them it's okay and try and get, uh, get them to seek out help. Thank you, Dr. Ungar. Dr. Shagla, when do you think international travel can resume? When can we stop wearing masks? And when can we start hugging each other? Well, uh, Dr. Henry has, has uh, suggested a hug day in uh, British Columbia, which is, you know, definitely uh, within the map. And again, you know, I think that that goes back to the risk profile, right? When people are fully vaccinated, even if they transmit, um, their their risk of having significant complications is greatly minimized. And so I think, you know, in the next couple of months, as we get second doses into vulnerable individuals, that likely is going to be something that goes on the table. The dropping of masks, so, you know, I think the U.S. made a big stir in the last couple of weeks about dropping masks and really putting it on people as their individual risk. Um, so, you know, the individual who's fully vaccinated can take off their mask in public rather than necessarily a public approach. Many other countries have taken that public approach and said, when a significant number of the population is vaccinated, we can take off the mask as compared to an individual being vaccinated. And I think it you know, likely makes sense. We have vulnerabilities still in particular environments like workplaces where uh, you know masking is an important part of the bundle of controls to prevent widespread COVID-19, especially with variants circulating, that we wanna be careful about ripping off masks very quickly. Um, and the travel piece, I think, goes back to some of the important themes that we were talking about in terms of global vaccine equity, right? And, and um, you know, I think there, there are places that have very good epidemiology that we can imagine traveling to in the next few months, like the United States, the EU, um, uh, England, where, where, you know, again, you have a good sense of what they look like, what variants are circulating, their health systems being reasonable, vaccine strategies being there. The ability to test and trace being aggressive. And so, you know, I, I you could certainly foresee those types of vaccine passports similar to, to what the um, what UK the UK did with Portugal fairly recently. Um, but our ability to travel unabated to other parts of the world is going to be still tricky. Um, and that really is not only what's going on in their fundamental healthcare systems. Um, but also what's going on, uh, yeah, in terms of their vaccine uptake, in terms of their transmission, um, and, uh, and again, you know, the, the ability of the unknown of a circulating variant or something along those lines in that context. So, you know, I think vaccine, you know, travel certainly is going to be a part of, of the, the reopening plan, and I can foresee the United States probably being our first partner and then elsewhere after that. But it's not going to be as simple as, you know, you can fly to anywhere at any point in time. There is going to be a balance between what's circulating viral evolution, vaccinations, and that piece as, as part of it. Thank you, Dr. Chegla. Next question from Joanna Frikidich, uh, Hamilton Spectator. What do you think of, the, of Ontario's three-stage opening? Is it gradual enough? Does it go too slow or too fast? Are there certain risky activities set to open too soon? Dr. Shegla, would you like to weigh in on that one as well? Yeah, I mean, the, the roadmap to reopening, I think in Ontario, takes into account a couple of things. One is the factor ICs are still full. Um, and, you know, I, I think being a clinician and seeing patients there, there are patients there that got infected well before the lockdown happened in Ontario that are still on ventilators and ICUs. And, you know, they're not leaving as quickly as we would like and, and reducing community rates of transmission and vaccinating the population isn't getting them out of ICU any faster because they are fighting through their illness. 
Um, and so, you know, I think recognizing that our ICUs probably need to be healthy before we start engaging in any risk, um, uh, as, uh, as you know, that's, that's going to be a, 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 an immediate turnaround to things, which we don't want people to go through again. Um, you know, I think the, the opening plan in Ontario prioritizes the outdoors more, um, tries to integrate low risk activities and then push into higher risk stuff. Um, and, uh, and tie it to vaccinations and tie it to a time after developing immunity after vaccinations, which is important, noting that those people are less likely to end up being represented in hospitals, ICUs, and deaths, even if they do break through COVID-19, break through and get COVID-19. Um, so, you know, I, I, I think our plan is, is reasonable. You know, I, I think it, it, again, leaves a lot of wiggle room, both to speed things up, but also to slow things down if we're seeing uh, um, scenarios where things are getting out of control um, or gain, you know, significant improvements that weren't expected overnight. And, you know, I, I think the other part of it is no one wants to go through this again. Everyone is fed up with lockdowns. Everyone is fed up with, you know, what, what we went through. Businesses are struggling and hanging on by the teeth. The government, and I think all of us are very responsible to say, can we do this with vaccines appropriately and open one last time and not have to close again? And, you know, I think this this plan really does incorporate some of that in the into, uh, you know, uh, using vaccine targets and using surveillance and using healthcare utilization as pieces to not necessarily go back into what we went through over the last few months. So. You know, I don't have issues with it. I think it's dynamic enough and it leaves a lot of room to, to really balance things. Um, and it doesn't set hard dates, which, which again, you know, is, is tough for businesses, but um, at the same time really is, is part of the instability of the world we're dealing with, uh, especially with vaccines right now. Thank you, Dr. Chegla. Next question from Melissa Kudo-Zuber, Canadian Press. I've heard about some instances of people leaving vaccination clinics when they find out they're getting Moderna instead of Pfizer. Have you heard any uh, about this happening in your areas? And where is this seemingly sudden misconception of Moderna as a, an inferior vaccine coming from? Is it concerning to see that? And how do we convince people who now believe Moderna is not as good of a vaccine as Pfizer? Dr. McGear, would you like to weigh in on that one? Sure. You know, I, I don't think this is a significant issue. Um, I'm on the receiving end of a lot of emails and phone calls of people with strong opinions, and I've heard strong opinions in favor of Pfizer and strong opinions in favor of Moderna. And the truth is that the data on them are as close to identical as you can get. Um, uh, so, uh, you know, there really is no difference between them. I think there are some people who think that Moderna is better because the company has been in the business of making mRNA vaccines for longer. And after the first dose, your antibody levels are a little bit higher. Um, and there are people who think Pfizer is better because Pfizer is a bigger company and they've got a lot more experience in many different vaccines. And I, you know, this is, I, I, you, you can speculate endlessly, but the data says they're identical, and I, I can't imagine. I, th I think this arises out of out of the potential differences between AstraZeneca and the other vaccines, and all of the confusion uh, about that communication. Um, but I, I I can't imagine this is going to become a significant problem. Thank you, Dr. McGear. It looks like Dr. Hill has would like to weigh in as well. Thanks, Ryan. So I think it's really important to remember that there is a lot of misinformation out there still about COVID, about various vaccines, about really everything that's been related to the last year. And um, it's all equally poorly founded in science by definition of being misinformation. And so we've seen a lot of more incredible types of stories about microchips and things like that. But most people, when they have access to misinformation or when they buy into misinformation, it's not the very far out um, things. It's the things that seem plausible, the things that you know, maybe without entirely having read all the papers makes a little bit more sense at face value. And one of the things is that there are differences between the vaccines. And unless you've spent a lot of time sitting and studying, the subtleties between which vaccine is which becomes a little foggier and a little hazier. And we're asking patients to wade through a lot of information and a lot of different concepts to be able to come to what we call informed consent with really the realization that 
at the end of the day, there are two big types of vaccines. One has been shown to have a thrombotic event that is still a lower risk than COVID was at, at its peak here, and the other is not. But I've had people walk into the vaccination clinic, know that they're getting Pfizer, and ask me if that's okay or if that's the one that's going to kill them, quote unquote. And so these are people who are walking into the vaccination clinic. These are the people who are willing to get their vaccines. So you have to imagine that if that's the question running through people's head in the vaccine clinic, there are a lot of questions out there in the general population that are still unanswered. And that's what we're here to do today. We're trying to get that information to people who aren't reading the scientific papers necessarily, to people who don't have medical backgrounds, science backgrounds, or free time to read through hundreds of papers of research. That's the whole point of the media briefings and having experts like Dr. Unger, Dr. McGeer, and Dr. Chagla available to answer these questions is so that Ontarians have a place to go with good, credible information that they can rely on. Thank you, Dr. Hill. Last question, just a short answer from each one of our panelists with the same question. Uh, we know the pandemic won't end overnight, but what is one sign you will look for or maybe one that we've already seen that will signal that the end is near? Dr. Chegla, do you want to begin? I mean, I, I think the big thing is is our healthcare utilization, in particular ICUs. Uh, as, as you know, we saw last summer where ICUs empty out, where you know there were a significant amount of time where there was no one in ICUs, at least in in our region. You know, that's probably going to be the sign that that this has changed fundamentally into an outpatient disease and a less healthcare utilization disease compared to an inpatient disease. We're not there yet, but. Um, I think uh, that's probably what our future holds in the kind of foreseeable few months. Thank you, Dr. Chagla. Dr. McGear? I'm going to take an extension of Dr. Chagla's, one of Dr. Chagla's original propositions, which is about vaccination rates around the world. I think the, the, the sign of it coming to an end is when we're up around 40 or 50 percent of the world's population vaccinated as opposed to Canada's population vaccinated. Dr. Unger? Oh, I agree, because I'll leave that that number to the, to the infectious disease and epidemiologist. But I think when I can start having people over and living my life, just adapting with it, having a mask where I need it and some hand sanitizer, and then just getting back to my life, but incorporating that practice into it without impairing my life, that'll be my personal level. Exactly what that is, I don't know, maybe going to a see some live music or maybe having company for dinner, uh, because I feel comfortable doing that. That'll be my moment. Thank you, Dr. Ungar. Dr. Hill, would you like to add? Sure, I'll take a bit of a different stab at it. And I'm surprised that I went this way and not Dr. Unger, to be honest, but I'm gonna take a behavioral look at it. And when COVID stops being the automatic fill in for what is or tell me about on your Google search, I think that will be for me the focus and the, the sign that our attention as humanity has pointed elsewhere. When it stops being the thing that is worrying everyone more than everything else, That'll tell us that we've moved on, at least as a society, to other concerns. Thank you. Perfect way to end our uh, Q&A session. I'll pass it over to Dr. Hill to provide concluding remarks. Well, thanks for handing it back to me. And thank you, all, as always, Ryan, for doing such a great job on getting us through all of those questions. I'll remind everyone that we are grateful for you to attend today's briefing and for all of your thoughtful questions. If there were questions that we didn't get to, or if you have questions that you come up with later, please feel free to reach out to us again. That email address is media at lma.org. And we are happy to hear from you to help you schedule follow-up interviews with any of the panelists and answer any questions that you may not have had clarity on. Um, as we talk about things ending, it's important to note that this is my last media briefing with you all as president of the Ontario Medical Association. Dr. Adam Kassam takes over this weekend and you will be in exceptional hands with him. My 12 months as president of the OMA, both personally and professionally, have been consumed by this pandemic. And I want to acknowledge the tremendous losses we've all experienced and the tremendous sacrifices that everyone has made throughout the year. I also would be remiss if I didn't recognize the exceptional resilience and flexibility demonstrated by Ontario's doctors as they stepped up to help Ontarians through a public health crisis on a scale that most of us had never experienced before in our lifetimes. The acts of kindness, the acts of community that I've witnessed over the last 12 months have made me proud to be a doctor, 
proud to be an OMA member, proud to be a spokesperson for physicians, and frankly, just proud to be a human being who endured alongside all of my fellow human beings. So with that note, I hope that these briefings have been useful. I hope that you will continue to use them as a resource as Dr. Kassam takes over. And I remind you that if there are topics you'd like to hear your doctors discuss, please send along your suggestions to media at oma.org. Thank you again, everyone, for your time. Stay safe, stay healthy, and get your vaccines.